All right, we should be live. So thanks for everybody who's joining us or going to join us online. Uh, those who have been following us for the last month or so, we've been going over the book of Genesis. Uh, we finally made it out of day two. Uh, after about six or eight weeks. And even doing that, I don't think we ever scratched the surface of any of those things. I mean, uh, again, the whole of the universe is captured in verse 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, and the Spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the water. That's the whole of creation. So until we can describe every little minute detail of creation, we haven't explored verse 1 of chapter 1 of Bereshit, of, of Genesis. So we have to do whatever we, we're going to do to the best we can do it. So uh, with the time allowed, I try not to keep people for more than 45 minutes. Sometimes we go over an hour. <laughs> so uh, if need be, we might go an hour and 30. I don't want to. I don't ever want to go any further than that. So everybody, if you go an hour and thirty, just start raising your hand or something, unless the anointing's just really flowing. Because uh, you know, if that's happening, let's just go eight hours. I don't care. But uh, I, I live by the old saying that uh, the mind can only take as much as the butt will allow. People's behind start getting restless. Their mind starts wandering. So I can't teach you anything if your mind's wandering off somewhere else. All right. So uh, we're going to deviate. We're still in the book of Genesis this week, but we're we're not we're going to talk. We're going to look at day three, but we're not going to go in depth in day three. Okay, we're going to use day three as a stepping off point. Okay, uh, so we're going to look at look at something. I forgot to change my my headers on there. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even want to flip to the next screen because I forgot to change my headers. So. I just slide past it into into the first real slide. Okay, actually, I did change one of them. I left the other two in in Greek still, so that doesn't make sense to you. All right. So day three, uh, probably in next week, we're probably going to go over day three again, and we're going to break it down word for word like we did day one and day two to see if we can find anything new on day one and day, and day two. But this week, as I was studying day three, and I was going to break it down word for word, the Father started revealing to me something else. Something that in 30 years of studying Scripture, well, more, because I studied Scripture when I was a little kid as well, and I'm not going to tell you how much more over 30 I am, but we'll just say 30. <laughs> so in all that time of studying Scripture... I never saw what I'm about to present today. And I've talked to several other people and, and ministers and about what it is I believe that the Father's showing me because I always want to check myself to make sure I'm not just going cuckoo. Uh, and as soon as I presented it to them, they're like, wow, how did, how did we never see that before? So I think we're going to have one of those big wow moments today, but I don't want to oversell it. You know, you 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 under you understand and over delivers what I was always taught. So, <laughs> so, so now uh, I I think I might have oversold it just then, but <laughs> but we'll see as we jump into this. So let's just start reading Genesis chapter one, uh, verses nine through thirteen. This is day three, and Elohim said, "Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear." And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, or Eretz. And the gathering together of the Maim waters called he, that word seas there, uh, the herb yielding or And Elohim said, let the earth bring forth. What did I? I, I skipped a part, didn't I? Called, called he seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit uh, tree yielding fruit after his, own kind, after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. 
And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Third day. <laughs> Turned around too quick, didn't I? For <laughs> well, the third day. So, there's a whole, and you'll see next week, there's a whole big thing in that, what we just read there. But I don't want to go there this week. I want to go somewhere else. So I want you to just focus as on day three as this overarching thing. Because everything Elohim created on day three is all it will take to sustain humanity. Day two and day three created everything it took to sustain humanity. There was already light, right? Because he said in the evening and the morning were the first day, evening and the morning were the second day, evening and the morning were the third day, right? So there was already light. That cycle had already begun. And we, we talked about that on day one, how John 1 and 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you read on down in John 1 there, it says, And Yeshua was the life and the light of man. So Yeshua was that light interacting until day four, which we're not even going to jump on day four yet. We might get stuck there for a month. But where he hung the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we're talking about day three. So day three, do, do humans need to eat meat to live? No. But he created the fruit trees and the herbs, right? That's the things that we need to live, right? So on day three, we're, we're going somewhere because we've been, we've, this whole message, I don't know how it got twisted that way, but we, this whole message has been going along the lines of understanding frequency and understanding fractal math. You know, uh, uh, what's uh, nine times nine? Okay, so we have to break that down to a single digit number. Eight plus one is what? Okay, uh, nine, nine times seven. Huh? Okay, how many? 63? Six plus nine? Okay. Uh, just do nine times anything. And it'll always come back to nine. Okay? It's, it's an anomaly. So, uh, if I turn all the way around, how many degrees have I turned all the way around? 360? 3, 6, 0... Nine. Okay. So nine nine is what we call the God number. Okay. So now we're looking at day three. Let's jump over and look at day six. We skipped day four and day five there. Let's jump over and, and look at day six because we're going to talk about that three, six, nine factor today. Okay. Now, how many days was creation? Seven days. All of creation was created in six days, and on the seventh day, Elohim rested. So we say creation was seven days. But was that where creation stopped? Is it day seven? No. no. Okay, we're going to explore that today. Because we're, we're not only going to go to day six, we're going to go to day nine. James, how do you go to... The Bible doesn't say anything about day eight and day nine. But it does. <laughs> But it does. So we're going to go to day nine today. Okay? So let's read day six. Genesis 1, 24 through 31. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Now I want you to focus on that because we're going to, we're going to bring some scripture out here in a minute that's going to kind of freak you out. What kind of creatures did he say it bring forth? Living, living creatures, right? Okay. So keep that in the back of your mind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And Elohim made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image us is, is a what? It's a plural word, right? Our is what? A plural word, right? 
Okay, just I just put those putting those thoughts. I want to embed those thoughts in your mind because we're going somewhere else here in a minute. Okay. In fact, the word Elohim, the the very word Elohim, if you look at it in Hebrew, it means it's a plurality. That that word itself is means is plural. So. Elohim said, let us make man in our own image. So how many plurals did we have there? Elohim, plural. Us, plural. Our, plural. But three plurals in that one, that one statement, right? Three, six, nine. It's all, it's all there. It's the, it's the math. Got to follow the math. All right. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Elohim created man in his own image. Whose image? So this man that he created here on day six is created in whose image? Okay. So Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elo Elohim created he him, male and female created he them. Okay, now I want you to focus on something here. What did he create there? Male and female. Everybody get that, right? And Elohim created male and female. Okay. And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the, of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Okay? So what did he give us to eat originally? The vegetation. Everything that he created on day three, he gave, he gave us that to eat. Okay? So we could have been sustained without any other animals on the earth. But he said that he created all living things, right? On day six, right? We're going somewhere. I'm not. I don't think I'm totally senile yet, but we're going somewhere with all that. All right. Uh, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And that's the end of chapter 1. We jump into chapter 2. Chapter 2 starts out talking about the Sabbath. Okay, We're going to skip over the Sabbath. We all, hopefully, we're all messianics. Hopefully, we know about the Sabbath. Okay, So keep those things in the back of your mind so I don't try to lead you astray. We're going to jump over to day nine. What? What? Blasphemy. <laughs> All right. Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. And the Lord God and Yahweh Elohim, because Yahweh has appeared in chapter 2. It was only Elohim until, through chapter 1. Okay, Elohim, 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 Elohim. And then in chapter 2 it says, And yod heh vav -Hey Elohim. Okay, so we see, we see Yahweh Elohim appearing in chapter 2. Okay, he's clear in chapter 3. Uh, so, and Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground... Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Huh? We are for a minute. 
Because we're not talking about day seven or day eight. We're talking about day nine. Okay. So day eight right, is right here. He creates Adam. On day eight, he's like, here, Adam, what do you want to name this? What do you want to name that? What do you, he doesn't call it day nine because creation was complete on day seven, right? So we're starting a new cycle. So which would be day one again. Okay, day one and day two, but we're going to, we're, for the sake of argument, we're going to keep the count going and call it day eight and day nine, which it is, but it's also day one and day two. Make sense? Because the, the weekly cycle started over again as well. But the monthly cycle continues the count, right? Everybody see, you have two counts. You have a weekly count, monthly count. Okay, so we're going to go off the monthly count and say this is day nine. Or it's day seven right here. He's saying, Adam, walk with me in the cool of the morning. Talk with me. Here, I'm going to create these animals and give them to you. Okay. So let me go back. Let me, hold on. Somebody, I, I missed a slide. I didn't put a slide in there. Go, go back before 18 there, when, when Elohim creates Adam. Uh, should be verse 7. Yeah. Okay. So, so now, let's, let's look at that. So day one, how did he create everything? We talked, that, we talked about that, right? Everything he did, he spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be fish, and there was fish. He said, let there be animals, and there were animals. He said, let the earth bring forth grass and every herb yielding seed and every fruit tree that has its seed within itself, and it was, right? And on day six, he, he said, let there be man, and there was man, both male and female on day six, right? I know this is going to mess some people up, Because Adam and Eve weren't the first created people on the earth. That, that's another lie you've been taught your whole life. He created this first man and woman the same way he created everything. He spoke them into existence and they were. And he told them to go be fruitful and multiply. Did he ever tell Adam and Eve to go be fruitful and multiply? Hmm. That's kind of strange, ain't it? We're going we're gonna to get somewhere today. I'm reading here. It doesn't actually say that he said. He says that he made the beast of the earth. And that he said, let us make man. He didn't say that, you know. He said, let us make man in our own image. Every, everything was a said. And he said. And he said. And he said. But this is different. This says, and Elohim formed Adam from the dust of the ground, right? He, he, became, he became a participant with, with this part of his creation. The whole earth is complete. It says it was complete on day six, right? Behold, everything that he created was very good. And on the seventh day, he rested from all the work that he, which he had made. But then, in chapter 2, we see, and he planted a garden eastward of Eden. Huh? I thought creation was complete. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden. And then Elohim creates man. He kneels down and he forms and fashions man out of the dust of the ground. And he says, Adam, look. Look. Look at this thing. It's got this long nose on it. What do we want to call that? And Adam goes, that's an elephant. God said, okay, it's forever going to be an elephant. God says, what's this thing with this bill and fins and fur? Kind of, you call that other thing a beaver. What are we going to call this thing? Let's call that a platypus. Okay, it's forever a platypus. Adam named it all. That took more than a second, right? But I believe Adam was created with full control of his mind. Science says that at our peak, 
at our peak, we use six to nine percent of our brain. That's the, that's the most we got firing at one time. Six to nine percent. Can you imagine somebody's brain firing at a hundred percent all the time? He was created in the image of Elohim, right? But he was created even different than that first man. Because did it say to that first man that Elohim breathed into him the breath of life and that first man became a living soul? It didn't say that, did it? But with Adam, let's read that. Somebody read that for me. Verse 7 forward. Go ahead, Mahalia. He did what? He did what? He formed that man out of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the bre the bread of life, or breath of life, not the bread of life, the breath of life. <laughs> and then after he does that, he picks Adam up. He picks him up from wherever he created him on the earth. And he takes him to this special place. Takes him to his special place. This place that he separated out of the whole earth for himself. This garden that he created for himself called Eden. And he takes this man who he formed from the dust of the ground and he puts him in his special place. You know why? He, he's, he is distinguishing Adam from this first man. He told them to just be fruitful and multiply. Just the same way he told animals to. Fill the, earth. fill the earth. Burn in your lust. Mm. Go fill the earth. But this first man, he didn't even create him a mate, did he? He didn't even create him a mate yet. He's got him there in the garden, singled him out by himself, and they're just having this relationship with each other. Adam, what do you want to call this? He's the creator. Could he have not named everything? But he wanted that symbiotic relationship with Adam. He wanted, he wanted that relationship where they are interacting with each other. And Adam's opinion is just as valid as Yahweh's opinion. What? The Father elevated him to that same statue because they were created to communicate with each other. So much so that they walked together in the cool of the morning. They talked with each other. Right? He named all the animals. He named all that stuff. And then after, after Adam had finished his work, we get here. Go ahead and read down to 18, Mahala. And Yahweh started the garden of the east, and there he took the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, Yah Elohim made every tree grow that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. So the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four heads. And the name of the first is Sidon, it is the first, it is the one surrounding the entire land of Kabbalah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Belin is there, and the Shomon stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. This is the one surrounding the entire land of Cush. Mm -hmm. And the name of the third river is Bethel. It's close the enough. Rivers. It's better than, better than I could say it. <laughs> it goes toward the east of the And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And now Elohim gave, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. And Yah Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, now let's let's talk about that right there. <laughs> he put Adam in the garden. He's not created yet, right? Mm -hmm. He put Adam in the garden. He said, you eat of every tree that I've built in this garden, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that, Adam. Okay, because in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Right? Was Eve created at that point? Yeah. wasn't even It wasn't even a concept at that point, was she? Maybe in Yahweh's mind, but not in not in Adam's mind. Adam didn't know what it was to have a mate at that point. 
he didn't know what he he hadn't named her yet, so there wasn't no whoa man yet. <laughs> It's my joke, you know, when he create when he creates when, when he, it's great. It's a great dad joke. So he, God creates this woman, and Adam's been alone. He's he's been, you know, moping around the garden because God only shows up in the morning time. God makes this woman and she's got curves and she sets him in front of him and he Adam goes, Whoa, man. That's how we got women. <laughs> so Sorry, that's my dad joke. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to I wanted to highlight the point that Eve's not made yet. When the father gives the commandment to not eat of the tree. Because when I show you this next thing, it's going to be one of those <laughs> Why did I never see that before? Okay? And Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord El or Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to all the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. So he's had time to name every living creature, but he still don't have a helpmeet, right? That's why we're saying Adam, huh? I think they were. I think they were because Yahweh's. I think they're the same animals, but I think Yahweh's forming some out of the earth right in front of Adam. What do you want to call this? What do you want to call this? What do you want to call this? Of course, those were the same animals that were already populated that He spoke into existence as well. That's the way. That's the way it reads. Okay. Uh, where were we? And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was found, or was not found, a helpmeet for him. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. When do men sleep? At night. At night, right? So now we get into, that was day eight. Adam did all right on day eight because he had full use of his mind. He named all the animals, walked with Yahweh. Yahweh told him, Adam, don't eat of the tree. Oh, Adam, by the way, it's not good that you're alone. Let me, let me make a help meet for you. So he was, he was alone, but just for a minute. Okay? I, I'm just making this stuff up. Okay? I, it, could have been, it could have been a thousand years that it took Adam to name the animals. But if we're, if we're going into that same time frame, if we're putting all these events into the same time frame that the Father established in the first chapter, which I think we have to, if we're going to be consistent, we have to put it in the same time frame what he says in the second chapter as well, right? So let's say Adam was created on day, or on day eight, placed in the garden, named the animals. That night, he falls into a deep sleep. The father takes a rib from him, okay? So let's start there. Uh, fell upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elohim had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, Whoa, man, woman. <laughs> because she was taken out of man, therefore shall man leave his father and mother, and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so what was the first law of marriage that he gave right there? Leave to leave? Did Adam have a mother and a father? So why, why, would, why would that matter to Adam? Okay, Adam didn't have a father and a mother. He was, he was the first created of Elohim. So that was the Torah. 
That was the Torah being taught to Adam from creation. Adam, you're going to produce seed. And when you produce seed, that child is to leave his father and mother. He's going to leave you. And he's going to go make a life of his own. That's the worst thing we do to our children. We want, well, uh, the Lord blessed us with a daughter. No, he didn't. He blessed your son with a wife. They're going to go off and make their own family. The same way you went away from your mom and dad and made your family, they're going to go off and make their own family. And Well, if you can't get that girl away from her mama, don't marry her. <laughs> no, just, that's a joke. I'm just playing with that one. <laughs> but the, but the, the son absolutely has to leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, okay? So that's the first, that is the first rule of marriage, okay? You think any mama raised her baby boy for 18 to 20 years and says, hey, little girl, you go tell my son, you become his helpmate. You start taking it. You, everything I did and everything I raised him for, how you just take that free of charge? Mamas don't do that. They're like, no, he's mine. He comes out of my loins. He belongs to me. No, no. Oh, mo more. most of them. They're... Because you are no longer, the biblical principle is you are no, once you take a wife, you are no longer under your father's covering. Because now she hurts her. her. It's, it's a, she, he doesn't have to tell them to leave their mother and father. When the mother and father gives them to that man, she has no connection with them unless that man says she can because he has now become her covering. Okay. She doesn't have to say that to the girl. I know that it's a fun joke to make and say, yeah, well, the girl doesn't have to leave, but, well, if the husband wants her to. If the, if the husband wants her to, yeah. There cannot be two coverings, and you can't have that struggle going on in your family. Well, you need to get your wife in order. No, you need to shut up and stay out of my marriage because I'm recovering. Well, well, uh, you need to you need to tell your husband that no, you don't need to tell your husband nothing. And we're going to see we're going to see those laws. That's the first rule: is leave your father and mother, cleave unto your wife. Your wife should have our when you, she was given to you, she had already left her father and mother, right? Now it's your turn. Yeah, exactly. They gave her away. So she became your possession. The same way Eve, I know people don't like that term, but Yahweh, did Yahweh, here's the thing. Did Yahweh create Eve for Yahweh? No, she was not created for Yahweh. She doesn't belong to Yahweh. He took something from Adam, created Eve, and gave it back to Adam. Eve is Adam's possession. Okay? She is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She belongs to him. And I know that that messes a lot of women up when you say possession. <laughs> well, bless God, it's women's living in the United States and ain't no man going to tell me what to do. <laughs> Did I do a good impression or not? <laughs> well, they're not, their argument's not with me, it's with Yahweh. He's the one that established these rules. Okay, I didn't, I didn't set them into motion. He did. And the first rule that he established, which is our topic today, rules of marriage revealed in the fall. Okay, So this is the only rule for marriage that was revealed before the fall. That he was supposed to leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. The rest of the rules for marriage begin to be revealed at the fall. Okay. So that was day nine. I want you all to listen to this. I just found this little video, found it interesting because I was talking about 369, talking about that frequency, that fractal math stuff. But listen to the way this guy breaks it down. I don't agree with everything that he's saying, so just understand that. But, but his math and his logic is unflawed. Okay. Some of them never been exposed to the ones of life. People mentioned spiritual abundance of the life. 
And I'll show you why we're so fascinated with the lie. Mm. The reason that we like it doesn't lie in the design. The secret of my adoration lies behind the lie. Remember, the lie is special meaning is the law. A spiritual significance that needs to be defined. Men's relationship with the number nine is hard. It has its beginnings and its origins in God. Here is an example that I'm giving to you first. Consider there are nine planets in the universe. Mercury, uh, Venus. Okay, did you hear that? Consider there are nine planets in the universe. So he's using he's using all these nines. Something that has never been explored in all his life. Paint a mental picture of the guns you can find. And I'll show you why we're so fascinated with the nine. Mm. The reason that we like it doesn't lie in the design. The secret of our adoration lies behind the nine. Remember, the nine's special meaning is the bond. A spiritual significance that needs to be defined. Man's relationship with the number nine is all. It has its beginnings and its origins in God. Here is an example that I'm giving to you first. Consider there are nine planets in the universe. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and the Mars. Plus the other five planets resting among the stars. They're all heavenly bodies, but here lies the wisdom. Consider that your heavenly body has nine systems. A planet for each system. A system for each planet. There seems to be a symbolism that we take for granted. A circulatory, reproductive, skeletal, and nervous, muscular, and endocrine, the others go researching. And then just prepare. The universe is 999 times 999 times squared. Mm -hmm. There's a little science for the time dropped back from the mind of the sign, number nine. Nine represents birth, completion, that's right. all. Take notice how the ninth month is the star of fall. Mm -hmm. It's the third out of four seasons, so keep what you find that the three for the season is the square root of nine. Uh -huh. Boys from the nine millimeters keep on gunning. Uh -huh. My mother Ty said that nine is the number of the woman. So look closely at the word feminine. As I hear that, yeah. it, nine is the number of woman. Because that's now. Now, I want him. I want him to get to that point. I'm. I'm sorry. We're gonna have to listen to it one more time because I. I had to stop there because I wanted to make this comment when he got to that point. So and he'll and he says it in here, but I want to. I want to say it even more. So, huh? Okay. So let's get it back on me. Can you see me now? All right. It's back on me. All right, so if we if we do that, so male and female was created on what day? Six. Day six, right? And God's woman was created on what? From the waist down, when a woman is pregnant and giving birth, what does she look like? A number nine. Right? Her belly is out, and then she has legs. Number nine. Yeah, I mean, we've got a basketball in her belly, so. So, six, six and nine. Okay. Pretty pretty cool thing. Sorry, we're gonna have to listen to this guy again. This is he's rapping to a bunch of his friends about the number nine. <laughs> yeah, he's teaching them at the same time. Yeah, he's teaching them at the same time. Something that has never been explored in all this life. Paint a mental picture of the guns you can find, and I'll show you why we're so fascinated with the nine. The reason that we like it doesn't lie in the design. The secret of our adoration lies behind the nine. Remember, the nine's special meaning is the bond. A spiritual significance that needs to be defined. Man's relationship with the number nine is all. It has its beginnings and its origins in God. Here is an example that I'm giving to you first. Consider there are nine planets in the universe. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and the Mars. Plus the other five planets rest among the stars. They're all heavenly bodies, but here lies the wisdom. Consider that your heavenly body has nine systems. A planet for each system. A system for each planet. There seems to be a symbolism that we take for granted. A circulatory, reproductive, skeletal, and nervous, muscular, and endocrine, the others go researching and then just prepare. The universe is 999 times 999 times squared. Mm -hmm. There's a little science when the time dropped back from the mind of the sign. Number nine. Nine represents birth, completion, that's right. all. Take notice how the ninth month is the star of fall. Mm -hmm. It's the third out of four seasons, so keep what you find that the three for the season is the square root of nine. Uh -huh. Boys from the nine millimeters keep on gunning. Uh -huh. My mother Ty said that nine is the number of the woman. 
So it comes with the word feminine, and you will find if you break it down right, that it's really feminine nine. The woman in nine. And that's just the same. Because a nine looks like the bottom half of a woman when she's pregnant. Ooh, so we have to take a nine to have a baby. Approximately 270 days she carries her seed. And that math is divine. You know, the two plus the seven plus the zero equals nine. A man, when he marries a woman, the band is placed on the woman's ring finger on her hand. Surprising? Here is something a little more enticing. Retailers use a nine in marketing and advertising. Pricing. A car is $20,099. Gum is $79. Candy is 99 cents. A girl in a bag is 3 99 They do this because they know the attractiveness behind nine. It always multiplies back to nine. Use any number with a nine, you can find this is true. Nine times two is 18. And one plus the eight equals nine. You know what I mean? Nine times eight, see that's 72. The seven plus the two is nine. This you can do. With one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Even nine times nine, ten, or eleven. Wow. Three hundred sixty degrees, you will find that the three plus the six plus the zero equals nine. Wow. All right, everybody, see that? So that that fractal. No, we're not laughing at you again. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> well, I don't like that one. <laughs> I, I like the message that he had there, though. That Sam. What you did to me was like, women are the completion of man. We are. You are. That's the. That's the whole. Beautiful. It, when we talk. When we talk about marriage. Where did the woman come from? She came from inside man. What is man supposed to be? Man is supposed to be the borders and the protection. Okay? So he's the outward shell. He's the skin. He's the, he's the protection of that woman. But how do we communicate with God? Do we communicate God, to God with our flesh or with our spirit? We communicate to God with the thing that is within us. But we can't do that if our marriages are out of line. Okay? We can't do it. It's not proper. We're out of, we're out of order. The Father established the order. So the wives, when a man is, when, when a wife is submitted to her husband and she is channeling that spiritual connection, that inner connection, he still can be that physical protection. He's the one that says, no, that's not coming any farther. Okay, we're going to stop here. Is there any symbolism, the fact that we, Eve was made from the rib and the rib is the protective part of the cavity? That's some some preacher made up some story. Well, that's the thing that protects the heart, and it's a great story. It's a great analogy. I'm not saying it's not. Yeah, but I agree. Agreed. So, and it's a, it makes for a great analogy. And if you if you're teaching that message about, but a woman is not a man's protector. So that that part of the analogy I don't appreciate. So a man is the woman's protector, and our society tries to flip that around. And we want to play to women's egos because who, who populates the church more today? Women. So we want to play to women's egos, so we tell them, you're your husband's protector. No, you're not. Oh, well, that's what they do. When they, well, the, it's the rib that protects the heart of a man. And, she, and without the rib, his heart's just we're able to wonder what. So putting her in a leadership role, she's not in a leadership role. No, no. And we're going to see that here in just a second. <laughs> Because I didn't establish the rules. He he did. Accepting Yahweh's judgment. So we have to establish that first, okay? Leviticus 18.4 Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances and walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Is that not a command? So we have to do his judgments, right? So if we were living in the land and the civil law of, of the Bible was in effect and somebody committed adultery, what would we have to do? Stone them to death. Now, we're not, we're not living under that governmental system right now. We're living in the United States where that's illegal because we are in the dysphoria. We're in captivity. So if we did that right now, I believe that we would be out of order okay? because we're living in captivity in another nation. But, but that doesn't negate that we still have to do his judgments. And it doesn't negate that Yahweh sees and knows all. And if you are committing adultery, if you're supposed to be killed, what is he doing in the kingdom? 
is he, well, you're into this for you. We'll let you commit adultery for a while. That's the point. That's the point. He's going to destroy you from among your people if you're doing those things. So you're getting death spiritually, whether you're getting it physically or not. The same way Adam and Eve received death spiritually the day they ate of the fruit. Okay? Leviticus 18.5 You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. you got to live in those judgments, right? Is there, is there a way to escape the judgments of God if you belong to Him? You have to live in them, right? Okay, we're just establishing some guide, some guide rules because we're fixing to, fixing to go somewhere where we're, the mind's going to go... Okay? Deuteronomy 11.1 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep His charge and His statutes and His judgment and His commandments always. Is that not a command? So we've got to keep three things, right? His judgments, His statutes, His commandments, right? That is His charge. His charge is that we keep His statutes, His judgments, and His commandments. Okay? Deuteronomy 11.32 And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. Okay? So we have to do them all. We can't, we can't say we're going to do this one and we can't do that and we don't do this one. So if we refuse to do God's judgments, if we refuse to accept God's judgments, are we in right standing with God? Are we not in fact in violation of the Torah by rejecting His judgments? Even if those judgments belong to us. Okay. So we're not talking about just doing His judgments. We're talking about accepting His judgments in our own lives as well. Nobody wants to get spanked. I don't want to get spanked. Nobody wants that. <laughs> don't. <laughs> you can get me giggling over here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so nobody wants to get in trouble with Yahweh. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. <clears throat> the roots of a successful marriage. Okay. We're going to go through chapter 3 real quick. But I'm going to show you something here. Now the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the field, which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? Okay. Did God say to Eve? No. Huh? We established that way back there, right? Because he told Adam that before, before Eve was even created, right? So was the serpent trying to deceive Eve? No, God didn't tell Eve anything, did he? Okay, just making a point. Now that half God said, "Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden," and the woman said unto the serpent, "We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden." But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Is that what Yahweh told Adam? Did he ever tell Eve that? We don't see a recorded place in the whole Bible where he told Eve that, right? Okay, I want to do that. So, it said God has said, how do we know that God sometimes did not tell Eve that? I mean, she had knowledge of it, for sure. She knew not to do it. God didn't speak to Eve. I don't know that. It doesn't say he spoke to Eve. It doesn't say to Eve. It says, and God has said. God hath said. Right. But, but who, gave, who gives Eve the instruction? I mean, we're assuming Adam. 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 Adam's the one that came to her and said, God told us we can eat of every tree of the garden except for this one. So don't even look at it. So yeah, he put the he 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 did what Judaism does. Yeah. They built, he he put, he 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 created the first Talmud. Yeah. <laughs> he built that first fence around that commandment. He's like, don't even get close to it, Eve. Don't don't you even don't you even think about touching that tree, because in the day you do, we're going to die. Okay. 
Do what? He did. He he was trying he was trying to dissuade her. Okay. Okay. So let, let's continue here. Elohim has said, "You shall not eat of it; neither shall you touch it, lest you die." And the serpent said unto the woman, "Ye shall not surely die." There we go back. The serpent had information. That Eve didn't have, right? Eve had a partial understanding of what that tree was, didn't she? She didn't have a... All she knew was she wasn't supposed to eat it. She wasn't supposed to touch it. So she had 10% understanding of what that tree was. The serpent had full understanding of what that tree was, right? That that tree was going to not kill her physically, but going to kill her spiritually, right? Because it wasn't the fruit, it was the act of disobedience, right? right? Okay, let's look. You shall not surely die, for Elohim does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as, not as God, right? But as gods, that plural there, Okay. We're, 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 we're going gonna, gonna to happen here in just a second. Okay? Yeah. This camera. Let's just shut that thing off. I, I keep walking out of its view is what the deal is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put it like that and leave it stationary. I think it'll stay stationary. Okay. So, uh, you shall not surely die. For Elohim doth know in the day you eat thereof, you shall sh your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. So Satan, or, or the serpent, had knowledge that Eve didn't have. He knew that that was only going to give her the understanding of good and evil. If evil didn't exist, could she have known what good was? Okay? You can't know what evil is if you don't know what good is, and you can't know what good is if you don't know what evil is. There has to be a contrast drawn there. So the tree, when she partook of it, disobedient, a disobedient act is what? Evil. So evil re allowed her to know what good was. Okay? We're, we're still not there yet. We're going somewhere. Okay. Uh, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food... What's that? Number one, the tree was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. So it was good to look, it was good, good for food, good to look at. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Didn't say it would make it wise, did you? He said that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Because she was told that it was the tree of knowledge, right? She didn't know it was it would give her knowledge, did it? She didn't know what kind of knowledge it would give her. She didn't know any of that. So she knew she uh, while she was able to do is oh it is edible. This what well, the fruit off this tree is edible. It's a, it's a easy it's for me. To, it's, I can consume it. Okay, and it looks good for my eyes. Looks good to me. And to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Okay, when she did eat, was her eyes open? Nope. Doesn't say that, does it? It says when she gave it to her husband, listen to what it says there, and he did eat and the eyes of them both were open when he ate, not when she ate, because he was her covering. She was she's the one that she wasn't commanded to not eat of the tree. He was. So the commandment was not first. The commandment wasn't even for her. Yeah, we're, we're there are commandments all through Scripture that are for men, and there's commandments all through Scripture that are only for women. She was assuming that the commandment for the man was a commandment for her taking on the man's role. He was assuming that too. 
If he, if she, if he's on the top, he assumed it as well. When he ate of the fruit, the eyes of them both were open. Because she was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Because the Torah has to be true. The Torah says, and we're going to get to this here in just a minute, she made a covenant with death at that point, didn't she? But Adam could have nullified that because the commandment wasn't given to her. God never instructed Adam to tell Eve to not have that tree, eat of that tree either, did he? Adam, in his own fear, put something on his wife that shouldn't have been on her in the first place. The commandment wasn't given to Eve, it was given to Adam. Don't eat of the tree. Huh? Why was Eve first? Because she gave it to him. Adam in fear ate of that fruit. Number one, she was cursed because she disobeyed who? Her husband. Her covering. He told her not to eat of the tree. No, hold on. If Adam would have stopped right there and he would have said, Eve, you stupid idiot, I told you not to eat of that tree. Would God have cursed it, Eve? He couldn't have. He couldn't have because the man is the woman's covering. God is the man's covering. If anybody would have got judged in that situation, it would have been the man. But God wouldn't have judged the man so harshly because it was his wife that did it. There would have been a covering there because what's the Torah tell us? If a woman vows a vow, even if she's vowed that vow to bind her soul to God, that in the day the husband hears it, he can nullify that vow. And God himself will forgive her and not hold it against her, right? Is that not what the Torah says? If Adam would have stopped her right there and said, Eve, you dummy, why are you listening to this serpent? I'm your husband, I'm your covering, why are you listening to somebody but me? So we can blame Eve all we want to. It goes back to, again, Adam. Eve didn't screw this thing up. Adam did. Because Adam was dealing in fear. The Bible says, Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add unto that which I command you, nor shall you diminish aught from anything that I command you, right? He added, to what? he added to what Elohim said, right? Elohim said, just don't eat of it. But when Eve repeated that to the servant, she said, we can't even touch it. Even, even if we touch it, we'll die. Did Elohim say that anywhere? So he added to the Torah. So in his, in his fear, in his fear, of losing Eve, of, of losing their connection with Elohim. He set up barriers that Elohim never set up, right? We don't have that right. We don't have that ability. It wasn't until Adam partook of the fruit that the eyes of both of them were opened. Let's, Absolutely. You shall not surely... Oh, I already read all that. Open. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim from amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid. What, what, what was that? Still He's still afraid. He's still dealing in a spirit of fear. How many times? 365 times in the Bible we are commanded to fear not. 
Okay. I was afraid because I was naked. Was he naked? It just said they already sold fig leaves to cover themselves. So what were they naked from? They were. He had stepped out from under the Father's covering. He was exposed. He'd already sold fig leaves. They'd already covered their nakedness. We'll go back and read it again. And they heard the voice of Yahweh walking in the in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid. The, oh, let me go back up one. Uh, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they had already covered their nakedness, right? And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Wherefore I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest, uh, the woman that thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And uh, Yodhevavhe Elohim said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle and above all the beasts of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. How was Adam and Eve communicating with the serpent? Can we communicate with serpents now? No. They were speaking. Huh? They spoke with it. That's what it says. So this serpent had the ability to communicate. And they had the ability to communicate back with the serpent, right? We don't, we don't see that happening again after they get out of the garden, right? No, I don't believe it is. So let's look here. So the serpent's curse was what? And you're going to be on the ground and, and there's always going to be tension between you and humans from that point forward. Okay? So, so that's the snake's, that's the, that's the serpent's judgment, right? Okay. So his, his judgment is uh, you'll be cursed above all the cattle and every beast of the field, upon your belly you'll go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between her seed and your seed, and his heel shall bruise your head. Okay? That means man's going to be killing you, your whole, your whole existence. Okay? And why do they have legs? Why do they have legs? Well, that's another thing. Now we're going to the woman's judgment. There was... There, there was Six verses there with the serpent's judgment, right? Adam has a quite extensive judgment as well. Eve's judgment is one verse. Just one verse. Genesis 3.16 Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. I want you to understand something here. Eve's judgment is tied to Adam's judgment. Do we understand that? What was Adam's judgment? He, the ground wasn't going to yield to him anymore. He's going to have to, he was going to have to go work by the sweat of his brow, toil and labor the rest of his life. That's not Eve's judgment, is it? Her judgment is she's only going to have sorrow in what? Okay. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay? 
The first one was, he's going to greatly multiply her sorrow. I have a question. Is that right? Go ahead. Is it possible? Because... We're, we're going over an hour today, I'm just telling you. <laughs> Multiply your sorrow and your conception in the pain you shall bring forth your children. This is a specific judgment on the Eve. But it's tied to it's tied to Adam's. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna show you. But what I'm trying to ask is, okay, so this judgment is it specific to her all women as Yes, like so like we've been taught this is for all women. Is it possible that this judgment is for the people that were alive prior were already having pain during conception and all that, and maybe Eve because she was set apart. Is an, is an animal sinning when it's killing another animal for food? No. 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 So that original creation that was just doing what it was supposed to be doing, they weren't sinning because sin hadn't entered into the world yet. I understand what you're saying. So I don't think they did have ch pain and childbearing until sin entered into the world. So are you telling me that everybody else that was outside the garden was they were sinning? It says that it cre it says it corrupted the whole earth. Sin entered into the whole earth. Okay. Okay. So Adam and Eve were the guidepost for the whole earth. If they would have remained pure, the whole earth would have. Because I don't. I, I wasn't there, but <laughs> but I, I'm assuming they didn't. The same the same way it wouldn't have been wrong for an animal to kill another animal to to eat it. You know, uh, frogs eating flies. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's a sin in that. Okay. So. Well. I, I, and God made them carnivores. I mean, there are carniv carnivoristic animals that can't live on just uh, vegetation. Okay? So I will greatly multiply their sorrow. That's number one. Everybody write that down. Number two is, I will greatly multiply thy conception. What does that mean? I mean, means she's going to have a lot of children. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> Instead of having one at a time, you might have three, five, six. I mean, sex tuplets. We've seen that numerous times, right? I've also when, the, when the original intent was probably just one. <laughs> no, I think it was just one originally. So he multiplied her conception. So now we go down to the patriarchs, and almost every one of the patriarchs were born from what? Twins. And triplets, yeah. So, number three, in sorrow you will bring forth children. Did those moms who had our patriarchs, did they not have sorrow? 100%. 100% they did. You don't think Jacob's mom having to put wool on Jacob's arms and deceive her husband... You don't think all of that was... I mean, because we, we see that... Uh, what was her name? Rachel? Rebecca? Rebe Isaac's wife. Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca seems like probably the most genuine wife of all the patriarchs. The only We, we see Sarah doubting the father that she's going to get a child. But the only the only problem we can see with with Rebecca is that she deceived Isaac, right? Well, then they have favorites, so that was not good either. Well, is it? Okay. Your desire, now here's, the, here's where women get, this is where modern day American women get twisted. So put down your knives, those, those straight razors, put them in your purse. I don't want to be bloodletted here today. <laughs> Okay, so your desire will be to your husband. Before the fall, who was her desire to? Yahweh. She didn't belong to him. She didn't belong to him. She was given to her husband. But they both walked with him in, in the, is what it appears to be. 
your desire will be unto your husband, and he shall rule over you. Is God ruling over you? Is God ruling over you, or is it your husband ruling over you? Because we just established, right, in the two slides before this, we have to accept God's judgments, right? If we refuse to accept His judgments, then we're not in right standing with Him. So how can we say we love God and we serve God when we can't accept His judgment and be submitted to our husband? Because our desire is to be unto Him, and He shall rule over us. But that's a minor judgment. When we get to Adam's judgment, you're going to see that everything is tied to him. He's responsible for it all. Anything? With the serpent, I guess, if we're going to go there. Yeah. With, with his judgment, you can see that the enmity is going to continue. Sure. With Adam's judgment, you see the ground cursed for eternity. Mm hmm. But with Eve, it doesn't. I mean, it seems like it's pointed directly at her. Like it's not carrying over. So, so it's to. like where just that servant lost his legs or whatever. So the way I the way I see it is, Yahweh's her judgment is lighter because now she's got a physical covering. All she has to do is go, honey, what do you want me to do? I mean, it just seems like it's more direct. It is. It is. It 100% is. It doesn't carry over to the rest of the world like, like, the, like, the, certain, like the servants did because there's enmity between the woman's seed and the servant's seed forever. Okay? That one says forever. And the curse to the ground is forever. Exactly. And the curse to the ground for Adam is forever. But it's like this is you are going to have these, you're going to have the multiple conceptions. You're going to have... I think that that has gone through... The same, that's why the enmity through her seed. Her seed comes from everything. And if we look at the next verse, it says that she's the mother of all living. Okay. So if she was cursed, the same way we were yet in the loins of our father Abraham, we were in the belly of our mother Eve. Okay. So I believe that that, I believe that scripture supports that that curse carried down through humanity as well. Okay, because a child is born into sin. It's not conceived in sin, but it's born into sin. Because there's no sin in the conception, is there? Well, unless it's rape or unless it's rape or something like that. I mean, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a husband and a wife making babies the right way. Okay. There's no sin in that. Okay. Your desire shall be unto your husband, and he shall rule over you. But now let's go to Adam. The man's judgment. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. And Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. What, why did we get judged? Because we listened to our wives. <laughs> Tell me that again. <laughs> no. No, that's not what Yahweh said. You can make up the story all you want to. Yahweh specifically said, because you hearken to the voice of your wife. Not because you ate the fruit. Not because you ate the fruit. That's not what Yahweh said. We can't put words in his mouth. <laughs> hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going, we're going there. What is it? I knew this was going to be a fire storm. <laughs> Now to step forward and say, he, no, stop right now. Is that it? Do what now? Exactly right. Is that what God was wanting? We said to Adam what he Exactly, said. because he wanted Eve to be obedient to her covering. This in the beginning. Yes. That, that's the picture of a marriage. Our, our marriage picture is supposed to mirror our relationship with God. Okay? A man's relationship to God, we're con the man is considered the bride of Christ. Right? That woman is part of the man. She's, she is his possession. She comes from him. And the two shall be 
one flesh. Like both of them, right? they're, they're 100% together. And Paul makes that clear in, when we look at Corinthians. The, un, the, the believing spouse can sanctify the unbelieving spouse. So if a woman's married to a flesh who's being an idiot right now, and she's truly serving God with every fiber in her, she's covering her husband. Is that God's design? No, no that's why their marriage is going to struggle. Because it's out of whack. What is it? If, he, if she's a helpmate, wouldn't that be her design? Oh, it is her design. It, it 100% is going to be. Because she is designed to be a helpmate. If she's stepping up into that, that's what she's supposed to do. She's a, she, if she's serving God and he's not serving God, she has to step up into that role. Okay? So I'm not telling a woman whose house is out of order that she's, that she's not covering her husband. But, but she, her husband is still ultimately her covering. Even when she's picking up the spiritual slack, he's still her authority. God didn't say he shall rule over you as long as he's serving me, did he? He didn't say he shall rule over you as long as he's a great human being providing for you, protecting you, and serving God, serving me to the best of his ability, did he? He didn't say any of that. Now we want we want you know, as women, women want to think that all that come out of his mouth. <laughs> he didn't he didn't say if, if he looks at porn, he's no longer your covering, did he? Yeah. <laughs> The point is, is he's your covering. He's your covering no matter what. But you come from inside him. You're that spiritual being. And you can be that connection to God. Understand if he's out of order though, who's his covering? Is he in any way slack in bringing correction to him? And if he's getting corrected, guess who's getting corrected? You are too. Because you're part of him. So you're covering him, and by covering him, that means the Father's still engaged in your life, but now you're both getting correction. It's accepting the judgment of Elohim. And it sucks. Because a woman's getting judgment that she had nothing to do with. She had nothing to do with Her husband's the one being the jerk. He's the one, he's the one out of line, but she's getting judged for it. Who's ultimately going to get judged for it, though? Man is. That's, that's where we're going here, okay? We're, we're going to be done after this, I promise. So now we went long today. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and, uh, well, if y'all find me buried out here on my face somewhere this week, you know why. <laughs> All right. And, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree. So two things there, right? You disobeyed me and you listened to, you listened to your flesh. Let's just, say, let's just say it like that. No. <laughs> We're going to... That that feminine that feminazi spirit that runs through the United States, we're gonna have to get a hold of that thing. I, I hey, I if you ever heard me teach it, which you, this congregation has heard me teach on covenant relationship, you know I always place ninety eight percent of all responsibility on the man. But that was women listening, or that was men listening to their husbands. Because they were men were listening to it. Woo! That's a whole other message. That's a whole other message. <laughs> men were listening to the wives, or to the women, not necessarily wives, but in society, men were listening to okay. the women who were trying to gain control. Let's back this up here, okay? So number one, God gave me Floridale for what? A help me. If he gave her to me for a helpmeet, would I not be an idiot to, to not let her interject in our decisions that I'm making for our whole family? Yeah. That would be dumb. I mean, if he, he called me to be the king and the priest of my home. It, I'm, yeah, he didn't call me to be the dictator of my home, did he? And some people leave the aider off of that. 
So, <laughs> so he didn't call men to be that. He called you to be the king and the priest. A king accepts wise counsel, doesn't he? But he also rejects foolish counsel, doesn't he? Now, when Eve gave him foolish counsel, what was his duty? He should have. But she had been there going, nah, 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 And you didn't do what I want. You didn't catch that fish like I told you to catch. And and he's like, I don't want to fight with this woman anymore. Just give me the apple. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm just I'm just playing. Know how it came out. We don't know. Yeah. It looks like so, he looks like stranger danger. Absolutely. That's a, you're exactly right. So it ultimately it ultimately falls on Adam's shoulders, is what I'm saying. And I'm not giving you women a pass. I'm I'm not. Because because you did go outside your husband's covering and listen to somebody other than your husband. Okay. And even and even to this day you struggle with that. And and I tell women this and it and it makes women mad. I mean it seriously makes them want to get their gun out and shoot me. Because when because when we talk about submission, that is the word that should never come out of a man's mouth in America. Because every woman, their their guns come out of their, their purses and their knives come out of their back pocket and their hair. Yeah, yeah, everything comes out. They're ready to fight when that word submission is mentioned by a man. Okay, but here's here's the simple the simple fact of it is was Eve submitted to Adam when she was listening to the serpent? No, no, because no, uh, because because number one as number one number one as soon as the serpent said hath God said Eve should have said no God didn't tell me anything He told my husband. It was my husband. If you want to talk to somebody, let me go get Adam for you. Let me get him for you. <laughs> so, so, so the so the first sin for a woman was actually not being submitted to her husband. Okay, but it wasn't a sin at that point because she didn't have the knowledge of that. But it doesn't even appear that Adam was requiring submission. It is, it's not needed. And that's why I try to explain to people forced submission is not submission. It's control. So any man who is saying, well, you, you, you wife, you better submit to me, you're wrong. You, you're dealing in a spirit of control. That is, not a, that is not a spirit of a king and a priest. Okay? A king and a priest directs. They direct the people and they lead the people in their kingdom. Right? They don't, they don't, they, they're not tyrannical in their rule. They're not tyrant. Exactly, they're not. If they're a good king, if they're a benevolent king, they take the needs of the people into account. More so probably than their own needs most of the time. Adam wasn't doing that. Adam was only thinking about his own needs, right? Because now Eve was fixing to get smoked. In his mind... If God told me, if God told me not to do it, then he, it must be for her too. You know why? You know why? Because that whole thing of equality, a big lie we've been told. That's the biggest lie ever perpetrated on the on the female populace in the world, is that you are equal to a man. No, in many ways, in in feminine ways. You are far superior to a man. In masculine ways, you are far inferior to a man. You weren't created to be a man. You weren't created to lead. When you are leading, you're in a wrong place. You're supposed to be led. Your desire is supposed to be unto your husband, and he shall rule over you. But there again, <clears throat> I don't understand emotions a lot. I'm, as I get older, I get a lot more emotional, shed a lot more tears, but sometimes I don't understand why other people are getting emotional. It doesn't, it doesn't register with me. So I have to go to Florida. Well, what, what was that about? Well, you were, you said blah, blah, blah. I'm like, 
well, I didn't mean it like that. And, I, and in my mind, I didn't mean it like that. But it just totally whooped somebody and didn't, re didn't realize that it even got the belt out. So let's read this. <clears throat> of which I command thee, say, thou shalt not eat of it. So he, he listened to his wife and he disobeyed God. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Again, it's just talking to him, right? But it was carried on through from that point as well, right? Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till the return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Who's the provider? Yahweh. Does the woman eat if the man doesn't till the ground? In this scenario, she doesn't eat if the man doesn't till the ground, right? She doesn't have babies if, if the man isn't tilling the ground, right? She, she doesn't have sorrow if the man isn't tilling the ground, right? So her judgment absolutely is tied to Adam's judgment. But this whole story is about reconciliation, isn't it? Because the father does what right after this judgment? He restores covenant. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Remember what we read in chapter 1 when I told you to focus on all living things? Was Eve literally the mother of beasts and cows and all the other people that were created? All the other people that were created? We're, we're going to explore that as we go through this teaching. 100%. Yeah. Okay. So Adam called his name, Adam called his wife's name Eve or Ahava because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, unto and unto his wife did Yahweh Elohim make coats of skin. So what did he have to do? He killed an animal. Sacrificed it. He made the first sacrifice. You know why he made the first sacrifice? Because he's the one that put the tree in the Garden of Eden, right? Huh? Wow. James. So who had to make the sacrifice for sin? God did because he set up the scenario for sin. Exactly. His son. And Yahweh said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, and uh, to know good and evil, and know, and now least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God killed Adam for mercy. Do you understand that his judgment is mercy? Because if God did not make Adam die, Adam would have lived forever in a fallen state. He would have partaken of the tree of life and lived forever in that fallen state. But now that he's died, the same way Yeshua had to die, God can resurrect him again to himself. So even, even God's judgment is mercy. That's why he said, you have to do my judgments. You have to live in them. You have to dwell in them. You have to walk in them. When you reject God's judgments, you reject God. You reject His mercy. You reject His Son. Because who ultimately was God's mercy? Yeshua. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. So he took him out of God's special place, right? 
He took him out of his special place. said, you can't be here anymore. There's something different between me and you now. We can't, we can't communicate like we used to. So I got to take you out of here. Okay. Uh, send him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Okay. So there, nobody's ever going to reach the tree of life. Because there's, it's here. It's on the earth still, I believe. But it's held in obscurity. There's a sword going around. Anything that gets next to it, dead. I have to believe, if I'm going to believe the word, I have to believe it all, right? Okay. To our portion this week, Exodus 18, 1 uh, through 2023. 20, uh, prophets is Isaiah 6, 1 uh, through 7, 9 through 5 through 6, and the gospel is Matthew 19, 16 through 26. Thanks for everybody who joined us online. We'll see you next time at Beth Uh Sorry we were so goofy today, but hope you got something out of that teaching. Shabbat Shalom.